Thank you. And in that reading, I'm, I want to spend just a minute, I was, I'd like to say, put upon my heart to say this. I like that one phrase, to serve God without fear. And I'm in my 36th year, is that right? 36 years or I don't know, something like that. <laughs> Over 40 years at any rate, I've been involved with a professional pastoral ministry. And I can say without question, without any question, that the, the, the most difficult and almost impossible, almost impossible um, stumbling block to overcome with people is their fear of God. And they receive that fear of God from their parents, and then they receive that God from their churches, and they spend their lives always afraid. And most of these people, well, I shouldn't say most, a good part, portion of these people, they just finally leave church. And they never come back. Because they cannot hear this notion of, uh, of damnation and how bad they are in the sight of God and how hard they have to work on being holy. And, uh, uh, and it's virtually, virtually impossible to convince people. And they'll say, well, yes, but, David. Yes, but, David. And they still believe that they're bad people. And they still believe that they've done something wrong. And I might add that one of the things, and I, I'm sure everybody here knows people like that. And, and, and I hope nobody here has ever had to suffer that kind of that torment. But I'm sure you all have friends who have suffered that torment. And maybe that's something we need to be working on in this fellowship. We, you know, we've been talking about inviting people and encouraging people. Is um, there really is nothing to be afraid of? And somehow, some way, um, we have to do more than say that because I've said that repeatedly. And yet, repeatedly, I hear, yes, but. And it just goes to show you how deep the damage is um, uh, to people, particularly when they're little, you know? And so they spend their lives having to earn God's love, and, uh, and they end up living miserable, miserable lives. It's a sorry world sometimes. <clears throat> it's a sorry world. There is a... Um, answer to that, and that's what this very brief message is about as we prepare for um, Christmas Eve. I had here in my first sentence that perhaps the second greatest emotion found in the stories leading up to the birth of Jesus is fear. And so if you read particularly Matthew and Mark, um, that's what you read, is fear. And that's the secondary emotion that is presented. <coughs> now, this fear comes in different degrees and uh, different um, um, intensities. It comes, uh, this fear does, uh, from the very sense of terror um, that um, some people uh, encounter as a result of this birth and what's happening regarding this birth. And to a mild, milder sort of fright um, that we read about as well, but regardless whether it's this abject terror or, or just being startled and scared for a moment, nonetheless that, that fear is, is woven all the way in to the fabric of the nativity stories. In Matthew, for example, Joseph, you, you can, I could have put these passages down. I, you know how to read Matthew and Luke. Uh, in Matthew, Joseph is afraid, uh, and we must honestly uh, conclude, he's afraid about what he's supposed to do uh, with his uh, um, betrothed Mary when he, when he discovers that she's pregnant. And he's afraid. What am I going to do about it? He's afraid about this. He doesn't know what he's going to do. He's given an answer in a moment. 
He also, and you'll discover this in Matthew, the very last scene um, that we have of, of Joseph in, in Matthew, um, we hear of him uh, frightened um, when he has to figure out how he's going to get Jesus and Mary back um, to, to Palestine from Egypt. He knows he can't go to Bethlehem because he knows there's still um, people probably going to try and kill him, Mary, and certainly Jesus. And so he doesn't know what to do. And so we discover that kind of fear that, that surrounds um, Joseph. Now in Luke, the father of John the Baptist is frightened when, while tending to his temple duties, an angel materializes to tell him of the impending birth of his son and the significance of John the Baptist. Namely, of course, who will be the one who heralds in the Jesus movement. And fairness, if I were here and I come in here sometimes and I offer myself up in prayer, and I would be very frightened if, a, if an angel all of a sudden showed up. So in all fairness, <laughs> man, I couldn't understand that. But nonetheless, there is that sense, not of angst, but just, just good old-fashioned being afraid. Okay. Mary, too. The Blessed Virgin is startled into fear when Gabriel shows up, visits her, and then announces that she will bring forth the Savior of the world. Now you have that fear. And who, forget, who can forget the shepherds scared out of their wits when the skies crack open and they encounter the heavenly host uh, that sings out... Um, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men, or with whom God is well pleased. So you have that in the principles of the story, that every single one of them <coughs> is afraid. And that this fear has something to do with the birth of Jesus Christ. They may not quite understand that, but that's certainly what it's all about. And then, <coughs> excuse me, on a very dark uh, uh, side there is also the fear that King Herod begins to have seep into his black heart when he realizes um, that uh, he's in trouble. And you always notice that despots, the way they deal with their fear is they try to eliminate it, and in eliminating it, and they end up killing all sorts of people. And that's, of course, exactly what happens with Herod. Not only do you find uh, this sense of fear evident in the birth stories of Jesus, you also will find it unmistakably this same emotion um, in, in Luke's Gospel when, when the women arrive at the empty tomb and they encounter the angels there and are sore afraid. As well as the disciples when they encounter the angels as well and are afraid. In fact, they are startled and frightened. Uh, the Lucan account would have us know when um, the resurrected Jesus first appears to them. And then in Matthew, once again, um, it is the initial state of fright that overwhelms the women at the tomb, uh, not to mention the tomb guards, of course, who upon seeing the angel, and I quote this uh, from Matthew, uh, quote, were so afraid of him, the angel, that they shook and they became like dead men. 